Hello there, ATS 315 students. Dr. John Schrage here, and we're starting Module 6. And just like at the beginning of the other modules, I thought I'd show you another example of Linux in your life and how Linux has been around you all the time. You didn't even know it. I mean, here you're learning all about Linux. It turns out everything around you has been examples of Linux. And today I wanted to show you something, a place where you didn't probably think Linux was there. Um, I'm right now on Creighton's email on the webmail server. Uh, you probably do this all the time yourself. Um, you know, you go to Creighton's webmail service and you do whatever. And you probably know, because you're way more sophisticated about such things than I am, that if you click over here on this button, you get the various web versions of uh, the Microsoft Office software. Like there's a web version of, of Word, there's a web version of Excel and PowerPoint and so on. And they can do many of the same things that the regular installed versions of Office can do. And um, it's kind of impressive that you can work with your files anywhere as long as you've actually stored them on Microsoft's uh, curated service, OneDrive. Now, I'm actually not a big OneDrive guy. I only have put up a couple files over there. I actually tend to have all my stuff on Google Drive where I have 77 gigabytes of files. Uh, but just to demonstrate, I put a few files up over here. And, um, you know, Creighton pays for space on Microsoft's cloud services, uh, OneDrive. And you can put, you know, I think each student gets, I don't know, 100 megabytes or something of space. And every professor gets, I don't know, 10 gig or something like that for free as part of the deal with Creighton and between Creighton and Microsoft and so on. And um, if you think about it, it's kind of impressive. I mean, all of this stuff, you know, Microsoft sells this to millions of enterprises all around the country. And all of them can, you know, store their data up here on OneDrive and it's... Uh, secure and it's reliable. It's 24/7. I can any day, any place on the planet, I can log into OneDrive and get my files. I can sync them to my Android phone. I can sync them to my iMac. I can do whatever I want with them. That's actually kind of impressive that all of that kind of services exist for Microsoft um, or Google or Apple or Facebook or oh, Facebook doesn't have a OneDrive type service. Uh, Dropbox or um, any of a number of those similar kinds of services and. This is all part of an initiative at Microsoft called Microsoft Cloud, is how they brand it. Um, it's actually Microsoft Azure. Uh, Azure is their set of technologies for uh, running a uh, cloud-based um, applications like Word and Excel and so on that are on the web. Um, man, that's a whole lot of Microsoft stuff. And they sell it. They sell it all over the place. Um, and they advertise it all over the place. And if you run an enterprise, a company, or something like that, you can get you know Microsoft support to put your apps on the web and to put your databases on the web. And they advertise the heck out of it. Uh, I've been seeing this particular ad that I'm going to show you right now a lot lately. We live in a world of mobile technology. But it is not the device that is mobile. It is you. When there is a game, when there is a training, when there is a goal, our duty is to bring that information as fast as possible to the people. Real Madrid have about 450 million fans. We're trying to give them all the feeling of being at the stadium. The Microsoft Cloud gives us the scalability to communicate exactly the content that people want to see. Microsoft Cloud allows us to establish a relationship that is more personal, is more direct with the fans. It will help people connect to their passion of living Real Madrid. Yeah, so Microsoft, one of, the, one of their customers is Real Madrid, and they need to be able to, or at least they believe they need to be able to, you know, stream video to 450 million fans around the world and, and post articles and pictures and stuff, and they all need to be able to be shared and so on. And, you know, we could do all that kind of stuff with Creighton, with um, with their cloud, uh, you know, associated with Microsoft Cloud and so on. And man, that is a lot of transferring and syncing of files. That is a really busy, in some place out there, Microsoft runs computers that work as the server that are holding all those files, and then when the client goes to OneDrive and wants to download some presentation or something, it can load all this. I mean, a whole lot is going on behind the scenes here of loading this uh, Microsoft PowerPoint file that I am right now in a cloud environment. This particular one happens to be blank. Uh, but, boy, millions of people in theory could be doing this all behind the scenes. 
Microsoft has some pretty impressive technology. Yeah, you better believe it. It's Linux. Microsoft sells web servers. You can buy a server from Microsoft, you know, when you buy the computer from Dell or something like that, and you install Microsoft Server 2008 or Microsoft Server IIS, or they have a couple different versions for different uh, sizes of enterprises. You can buy email servers from uh, uh, Microsoft where the server will be storing your messages and then you can access them through Outlook, Outlook or similar such program. Um, yeah, you can buy them. They just would never in a million years work for one OneDrive. Microsoft servers are terrible. They run Windows, and they are very, they're good for small purposes, okay? My wife, my wife is a dentist. My wife's dental office has a Microsoft uh, Windows 2008 server, and it is where all the dental records are kept. And when a hygienist or a, you know, whatever needs to pull up someone's records in one of the dental operatories, they can click on their computer, and, you know, their computer's the client, and it connects to the server that's in the, front office, and it does all of its Microsoft networking thing and transfers over to the hygienist workstation, your dental records and your history and all that kind of good stuff. My wife's practice is not huge, there's three operatories. Between three operatories working with computers, maybe somebody working on billing, you know, at any given time there might be four or five computers working with that server, at, you know, four, four or five workstations working with that server at any given time. It's always running slow. It's always taking forever to transfer these x-rays and things like that. Okay? That's five. Five clients are attached right now. There are millions of people right now connected to Microsoft OneDrive. How in the world is it doing it? Because well, it's doing it because it's not a Microsoft server. Microsoft a long time ago figured out, nope, they have to, oops, that's not the right one. They have to run Linux. Linux is capable of supporting thousands of connections and, 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 and serving files to lots and lots of different computers under different platforms on different parts of the hard drive all the time. Okay? Microsoft servers work fine in a very small environment. In a small office where you're running, the network is running a printer and a, a shared printer and a couple workstations, Microsoft servers work fine. They don't work if you're, those kind of Windows servers just don't work for like large applications. Uh, Creighton tried for a while, um, until a few years ago, Creighton didn't have a web-based email system like we do now with Outlook. We had a web server, I'm sorry, an email server that you used a program like Outlook or Thunderbird or something to connect and get your email. The server held your messages and then you used a client to get the messages each time instead of in a browser. <laughs> and I think... In practice, there were 16 computers over there at Doit running the email. They had 16 separate Windows computers running Windows Microsoft Email Exchange, I believe is what it was, Microsoft Exchange Server, that's what it was called. Because if they had more than 1 16th of the total number of email accounts at Creighton on each one of those computers, it couldn't keep up. And even then, the email was really slow. Okay, you'd click to get a message and you'd have to watch the little thing spin for like half a minute before it got it for you. Okay, so, you know, you know, a few hundred people at Creighton were on server one, a couple hundred people were on server two, etc. And even then it was too busy. They couldn't keep up uh, and they had to get a go to Microsoft's web solution because Microsoft Exchange isn't really for that. Microsoft Exchange is, is you know... A, dent, a doctor's office where maybe you have 10 accounts, you know, each of the people who works at the office has an account and you might be checking. That Microsoft Exchange is a lovely email server for that application. For something like Creighton, where there were, you know, a few thousand accounts, it couldn't, it didn't work. You couldn't use Microsoft Exchange as a server. A Linux server would have been just fine. They could have had one Linux server sitting there for free and they could have been using that as their email for Creighton and it would have been fine. Why didn't they do that? Ah, because if you paid for Microsoft Exchange, Microsoft Customer Support is there to help do it anytime. If you get Linux to run your, e you know, if you get a Linux uh, computer running uh, the Linux email program, which is called SendMail, uh, as your email server, the problem is you've got to run it yourself. Do it would have to actually go out and hire somebody who knows how to run a Linux web server for a lot of reasons. What are you going to do if that guy quits? What are you going to do if um, that person doesn't know everything you thought he did when you took the job interview? Yeah, it's way better to pay the money and let Microsoft take care of this, at least if you're something like Doit. All right, so it turns out anytime you've been checking your email, anytime you've been using any of Creighton's uh, OneDrive uh, Microsoft apps and so on, you've been using Linux and you didn't even know it. 
Okay, um, we're going to move on then to the main lecture for uh, the Stephenson book for uh, Module 6. Okay, we're back, ATS 315 students, and I just thought I'd give you a quick little lecture about this great reading from the Stephenson book, one of my absolute favorites about the whole hog of operating systems. And I happened to dig through the, uh, the archives of uh, Dilbert, and I was able to find that car cartoon that he was talking about down there, where... Uh, you know, uh, Wally is talking, to, he comes across some engineer and he says, hold it right there, buddy. That scruffy beard, those suspenders, that sug, smug su expression. You're one of those condescending Unix types, aren't you? And he, and, uh, he writes, here's a nickel, go buy a better computer. You know, for years, this Dilbert co co comic was up in the atmospheric science department on the wall. And we were kind of condescending Linux users, and I totally get it. And with time, you're going to discover, man, all the advantages of this and so on. And in the reading of by Stephenson, he was talking about the fact that um, he was sort of betrayed by his computer. He was working with, I believe it was a, a Mac in that particular version of the story that he was before. And he had lost a document uh, permanently. Um, you know, that there was just no way to recover it. Uh, there was no tools available on a Mac to get the drive, uh, get the file that was missing off of his hard drive and so on. And uh, he talked about other examples of situations which had caused problems. For example, if someone was holding down the mouse button on the server, it would actually freeze the network. Um, this was an old, a problem that wouldn't happen today, but it's a good example of the kinds of problems that could happen on Macintosh or Windows computers. Um, at the time that he was writing this, you know, a lot of computers couldn't do more than one thing at a time. If you had multiple windows running on your computer at any given time, you know, Word was in this window and your browser was in that one or other, things couldn't change in one window while this window was in the focus. If you were working on your Word document, the web page in the background couldn't refresh, uh, for example. Um, you know, these kinds of problems, so somebody holding down the mouse button on the server, the server could not move forward and, and process requests from clients until someone got their butt, finger off the mouse button. Um, this made the author realize there's got to be a better way. There's got to be computers out there that are more powerful. These computers were running at millions of operations per second. Uh, nowadays, plenty of computers run at several billion operations per second. How come they're being slow about things like this? And, you know, you could think of your own examples of situations where your computer has uh, betrayed you, where your computer couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time, where, the, where uh, things that really ought not have been so complicated became a big deal. Um, it's that, that drives a, a guy like Stephenson nuts. He wants his computer to be hackable. He wants to be able to get in there and make it do what he wants to do, do the damn thing he's telling it to do, trust him on it, do the work, etc. Uh, he doesn't want all these built-in safety features. He doesn't want to have the computer have all kinds of ways of uh, failing. Um, and the analogy he draws is one of my favorites in the whole book. He talks about a drill and how he used to work at a construction site, and they had a drill there called the whole hog. Now, the whole hog is a real drill. I have a picture of a whole hog there. And uh, it is a dangerous piece of equipment. And what makes it a dangerous piece of equipment is it's extremely powerful and it doesn't have a lot of safety features. You turn it on and it will go. It does not... An ordinary home electric drill has like ratchet, um, you know, a ratchet in there that uh, if there's too much... If, 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 the, if the bit freezes up, like if you hit a nail as you're drilling or something, it won't like start flinging the, the end of the drill around and around and around and around. It, the ratchet will catch it and it'll just start making clicking noises as it doesn't let the drill, uh, the drill bit uh, it doesn't have that much torque. Um, the whole hog has no such feature. If you push the button, if you pull the trigger, it, the engine will run. And if it needs to flip you round and round because it's got the bit frozen up and uh, seized up because it hit a nail or something, it will gladly do it. The whole hog is very, very powerful, but very, very dangerous. It is not for every user of a drill. And I love the analogy that he talked about in there about how, like, if you only had experiences with 5-volt and, well, 6-volt and 9-volt drills and stuff like that, the little homeowner's drills that you get on sale at Walmart at Christmas time, you'd be shocked. I'm not sure you'd even know to recognize that the whole hog was a drill. And if your only experience of working with drills was the whole hog, You'd be totally confused by these simple little 9-volt drills that go as they drill in and they, they have all these safety features and they won't uh, work unless this is engaged and there's a... Yeah, you wouldn't recognize that as a drill. The whole hog is a dangerous piece of equipment because it just does what you tell it to do, whether it's dangerous or stupid or whatever. 
On the other hand, it works. It will always do what you tell it to do. The drills with all the little safety features, with the little ratchets on there that supposedly keep it from turning, uh, that, you know, if it seizes up, it won't try to flip the handles around. The trouble is all those little safety features can fail. And, or they can be engaging in times that you want it to have more torque. You're willing to hold onto the handle harder or whatever. They fail spectacularly in unpredictable ways. So if you wanted to make your drill safer, well, you put more safety features on the aspects that are there, making what it can do safer, or you don't give the product the features in the first place that are dangerous. Um, both of which seem kind of lame, right? I mean, I'm not a child. If I want to put in drill, if I'm doing some home repair, I want my drill to be able to drill, and I don't want to hurt myself, but I also don't want it to be, um, you know, some weak little drill. I have this fairly powerful... Uh, I don't have, I don't like, I don't believe in cordless drills because they're never powerful enough. And so I have a fairly serious, um, drill that I, I forget how big it is. Um, but anyway, it, 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 it will hurt me if I don't, if I don't, uh, uh, if I don't know what I'm doing. And in the same way, our computers are the same way. Windows and Macs kind of took over the world in part because they were safe. Your parents or your grandparents or insert whatever stereotype you want of people who are not good at working with computers, can use Windows and Macs and in general not hurt themselves. I don't mean literally hurt themselves like they're going to shock themselves. I mean as in like they're not going to accidentally delete their files. They're not going to accidentally uh, spread a virus. They're not, I mean, by and large, the computers are pretty safe. They are not going to be easily hacked. They're not going to be, a lot of safety features as we'll see on there. And as a consequence, they also, Windows and Mac, don't put a lot of features on there that could cause trouble. And we'll see any list of those in just a little bit. But there's going to be a whole lot of things that we do have on a Linux computer that we don't have on a Windows or a Mac just because they get you in trouble. There's no reason to put those on their computer. 99% of the users don't need them. So, like, for example, there's a lot of safety features on a PC. Now, I made this list actually a couple semesters ago. I don't know very much about, like, Windows 10, for example. I don't have a Windows 10 computer yet. But in general, most Windows computers, for example, have, have a folder called the Recycling Can. Uh, Macs have a similar such folder. And when you remove a file, it really doesn't destroy it. It doesn't really get it off your hard drive. It just moves it into the Recycling Can. So if you accidentally deleted a file, it's just there still waiting for you in the Recycling Can most of the time until you've emptied the can, which frankly most users almost never do. And so, your file, I mean, that would be a nice safety feature. If you accidentally erase something, it's probably still there. Uh, most Windows and Mac computers have antivirus and firewall and stuff like that pre-installed um, that protect you from a lot of stupid problems you can get into by going to websites you probably wish you hadn't gone to, or maybe you are glad you went to, I don't know, but anyway, you certainly didn't want to catch bad things from those websites, etc. Um, another really important feature that Windows and Mac computers have that keep you safe, most of the important directories of the computer, where like the files that run Windows are, like the Windows executable files and the Mac OS executable files, those files are locked or hidden. You can't, in general, go into the folder where Windows's actual, uh, you know, executable files are because you might accidentally delete them or rename them, and that would be bad. And so, as a general, those files are either hidden, like I mean, there's a way to actually make a hidden directory that you can't see it in, like Windows Explorer or on Mac on in the in the Finder, or you can't see them, but you can't access them; they're locked. Um, I wrote on here zero administration Windows. That product has changed its name in recent. Um, uh, semesters, I can't think of what it is right now, but I mean, it's the general tool that, like, um, you know, something like Do It can access your computer and fix things for you, uh, rather than, you know, you just get somebody to help you with it or something like that, you know, where you can get help from someone who knows and they can fix your computer remotely. Um, M Microsoft provides an auto recover tool that, like, if you try to make, um, if you have an installation of software that goes bad, it will um, get you back to your state, the last known state that worked on your computer. Uh, safe mode, if you have really seriously botched, like you've tried to install some new hardware, maybe more memory or something, and it went bad, uh, you can boot into safe mode where the computer will work almost no matter how bad you've, you've screwed it up, and you can start putting things back, uh, you know, reinstalling drivers and so on like that. Um, Windows and Mac both have 
uh, at the operating system level, some measure of control of cookies that your browser tries to install, tracking your, your passwords, etc. Uh, they have uh, almost any browser worth its uh, salt has warnings that when it notices phishing attacks and so on, it tells you not to do that. Uh, Windows Update, man, Windows Update is a miracle. Window, and Mac has a similar thing, and nowadays Linux has a similar thing too, where you know updates to the operating system come fairly regularly. Um, I think Windows sends updates once a week. Uh, and they're just being installed. And most of the time, you don't even need to confirm to install them, and sometimes you actually have to do a reboot or something like that. But most of them are, all these updates are easy, and you always have the latest, most patched version of the software without doing anything. You can't imagine how different that used to be. On old versions of Windows, like Windows 3.1, Windows 95, Windows 98, etc., to get an update, you had to go buy something. You had to go to the software store. There used to be such a thing as software stores. You had to go to the mall to a software store and buy a stack of floppy disks and reinstall it, okay, with the new version, which, of course, most people never did. Can you imagine that? People were out there surfing the Internet with an operating system that was what came with the computer when it shipped, but it had never been updated. There had never been any security fixes or whatever. Windows Update is a brilliant security feature, and you don't have to do anything. Again, insert your stereotype of someone who's not good at working with computers, your parents, your grandparents, your whatever, and their computer probably has the latest and greatest version of Windows or Mac OS or whatever, and they probably did virtually nothing to keep it that way. That's actually pretty impressive, but all those are things that can go wrong. If you've ever had a computer botch a Windows update, it's a big deal. My in-laws computer botched a Windows update and it took weeks of their computer over at Best Buy's uh, Geek Squad before they got it fixed, okay? Um, a lot of these other tools can be easily hacked or can be worked around and they are big problems. There's also a whole lot of tools that aren't available to you on your PC or your Mac just because what are you gonna do with that that isn't causing trouble? For example, Macs and PCs don't come with a web server. Remember on Linux, we just turn on Apache and Apache with our web server. It was the software that's sitting there waiting for requests to come in that says, hey, I want this from your public HTML directory. That's lovely. You can download those for your PC or for your Mac or whatever. There's, there's, you can download Apache. It's free. Um, there's, you know, Microsoft sells such things. Lots of companies sell other web servers and so on, but it doesn't come with it. Why? Because for about 99% of the users, why would they want that? They don't plan on running a website from their PC. They might, even if they are running a website, it's not off of their PC. They have it remotely hosted on some service like GoDaddy.com or something like that. Um, similarly, um, in general, most PCs and most Macs ship already with things like SSH and Telnet and FTP. And some of these are terms we haven't used yet this semester for file transfers and things like that. But they're hidden, okay? Because you know what? Most 99% of users don't ever need to transfer files from a, one computer to another via an FTP connection, or most users never need to use SSH. That's why PuTTY is a separate download. You don't need to download, most users never need it, so download it separately. Another big one, there's no compilers installed on Macs and PCs, okay? You cannot just write a C program in Word or, or Notepad or something like that and then compile it on your Mac or your PC. There's no compiler. Um, you can download them. Again, GCC is actually free. Feel free to download it and install it, and you can write p uh, programs uh, on your Mac or your PC, but that's a separate thing. Okay, you don't need to be... 99% um, of the users don't need that on their hard drive taking up space. They'll never use it. If they tried to use it for something, they'd probably just cause problems. They don't put that on there. That's great. That is exactly, though, the opposite of the worldview of the world of Unix and Linux. Unix is dangerous. It does exactly what you tell it to do, and there are no safety nets. For example, the biggest heartbreak in the world on the world of Unix, RM star. RM star will do exactly what it says, remove all files. Odds are that's not what you wanted to do. Maybe you are trying to clear out some directory or something like that, but odds are that's not what you wanted to do. And guess what? There's no recycling bin on, Mac, on, on Linux. When you type RM, it really does remove that file. It's gone. All the tears in the world are not going to make that better. Heavens, even something a little safer like rmstar.c, as in you want to remove all the C files on your on your current directory. Okay, are you really sure you mean that? Because like, what if you accidentally type, this is a common error, what if you meant to remove all your C files, rmstar.c, but instead you type rmstarspace.c. Okay, it's going to try to remove star, in other words, all files, and then it'll try to remove a file called .c. Well, there won't be any such file out there. 
and you've just destroyed the entire directory, and there is no way to get it back. Oh. See how that's the whole hog? It's trusting you. It'll, it's powerful. You want to remove some files? Boom! RM, they are gone. This isn't like dragging something to the recycling bin, and it's kind of gone, kind of still there, and, oh, but what if, it, what if something goes wrong? What if this has feature has a bug in it? No. RM, it's gone. Never have to say you're sorry when you erase files with RM. Linux is full of dangerous features. Most lit distributions of Linux come shipped with a web server. If not, you can easily download them. All of the distributions of Linux come with compilers. They come with a powerful RM command that removes things, and it is, has no safety net. It removes things forever. It comes with things like FTP and SCP servers that are for moving files from one computer to another remotely. That's wonderfully powerful. Um, a graduate student of mine can move files from his Mac to my server and back and forth, no problem whatsoever. <laughs> on the other hand, I'm also then nowhere, anywhere near and getting control of what files are going on and off my computer. Chesapeake is just trusting that the grad student knows what he's doing, okay? Uh, same with like Telnet and SSH, uh, ways that you connect like with PuTTY to the computer. Again, I can, you know, you guys are in that class, you just use SSH or Telnet or PuTTY to connect to Chesapeake and it just works and I didn't do it darn thing to set that up. It just came out of the box that way. And isn't that a little scary? <laughs> I mean, if somebody was able to hack into that computer and set up their own account, I'd have no way to stop them until I noticed they were there and locked out their account. Uh, Sendmail. Sendmail is the email program on uh, a Linux computer, and it is how spam is generally happens. Um, Sendmail is not interactive, like, you know, you click here and you click here and you click here to send a message. It is like you create a text file and then you have another text file that's a whole list of addresses, potentially millions of addresses, and then SendMail will send that text file to every one of those addresses. Hugely powerful. It's how like bulk mailings are done. It's also how spam happens, okay? Uh, a powerful tool. I can send messages to everybody in the class or whatever, mm, but a scary tool. <laughs> and if somebody ever hacked it or wanted to do something malicious with it, they certainly could. Another weird way about Linux that is uh, not the way Windows and Macs are is that it is infinitely customizable. Now, I know you're thinking, my Mac is customizable. I've, ch I've changed the background. I've even changed the, uh, the, the animations on some of the transitions. Yeah, I'm talking way deeper than that. I mean, I'm talking like the commands you actually use to make things happen and what they do. Let me tell you a little deep dark secret. Buried in your account, there is a hidden file. You can't see it called .cshrc. And .cshrc sets up a whole bunch of the settings as to how your account works. Uh, like permissions and aliases and things like that. We'll learn about it just a little bit. Let me tell you here three important rules about the .cshrc file. Firstly, do not change your .cshrc file. Secondly, do not change your .cshrc file. Thirdly, follow rules one and two all the time. I'm serious. Don't mess with it. You can easily get yourself locked out of your own account if you mess around with your .cshrc file. In much the same way that like on a Windows computer, all the settings that define what your account looks like are set up in the Windows registry. And there are such programs as RegEdit out there that are for adjusting your registry. And you can do some very powerful things if you know what you're doing by making adjustments to your reg, uh, to your Windows registry file. Uh, you possibly have seen people have really unusual looking, you know, their computer, when they bring up the Windows Explorer, it looks different than yours and stuff like that. Yeah, don't in general do that though. The Windows registry is a very scary file and if you mess it up, you can actually, you know, need to get help from somebody like Geek Squad or do it or something in order to do it. So we are not going to mess with our CSHRC file, but like for example, one of the things you can do in the CSHRC file is set up what we call aliases. Aliases are like exactly what they sound. They're like a little command you can type and it will do something else. Uh, something that would have otherwise maybe taken more characters to type. Let me give you an example. Right now when you're working on graphics commands in ATS 315, you're typing graphcc as your, as your compiler. There's no command called graphcc. Graphcc is an alias I set up in your .cshrc file that um, defines graphcc equals and then it's like GCC, because it's actually an identification of GCC, link to the graphics package, link to the X11 package, I forget, uh, link to, I forget, there's some libraries, I forget. But it's a whole mess of stuff, and I didn't want to keep typing, typing, and typing, typing. I made a command, I made an alias, graphcc. And when I type graphcc, or you type graphcc, it really means it's the equivalent of all this other stuff. 
that's pretty slick, okay? Um, lots of people set up, like, common aliases are, for example, in fact, many, many accounts, that's the default, that, like, for example, DIR is an alias for LS minus last. If you might remember, LS minus last is kind of like the list and show all the details. Some people, DIR, DIR was the command back in the age of DOS com computers for show all the details of a file, and so a lot of people still have that linked effect. Like I said, a lot of times that's actually the default on Linux. DIR means list and show all the details. Uh, for example, some people turn on so that RM is actually an alias for RM minus I. RM minus I is the interactive mode of remove where it'll actually ask you before you remove a file, do you mean to remove this file, Y or N? And so, like, if you remove RM star, it'll say, okay, here's the list of the files you're removing. Do you really mean that? That's a nice safety feature. Okay, so sometimes people have that alias set up. That's pretty slick. Okay, now aliases are only one of, like, t a thousand things you can set up in your CSHRC file to customize your experience in Linux, but it's also, even though it's such a simple little thing, even this has a silly, stupid dark side to it. But again, Linux will trust you. It's the whole hog of operating systems. For example, if you were being malicious, you could set, it's, if somebody uh, was logged into their account and they got up to go get a Pepsi, you could go over to their computer and type, and change their CSHRC file to set up an alias that the command CD will now be equal to RM star. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, think about what you do. The next time they use CD to try to move to a directory, CD is going to be equal to RM star. In other words, instead of changing directory, it's going to erase everything in the current directory. Nobody in their right mind would want that. But a hacker could, could break into your account and do that to you. Oh my God. Yeah. So it's the whole hog, right? I mean, that the it, Linux is not going to warn you. That is a stupid thing to set. CD equals RM star. It'll gladly do it. It'll just assume that you apparently want to do that, even though there's no way in your right mind you do. Um, I'll show you an example here down there at the bottom. Um, echo is a command in Linux that means something like print. And, man, when I was in grad school, we were such dorks. I bet you have a hard time believing that. And I remember one time we were working late at night at, uh, in, the grad, in one of the research labs working on programming, and somebody got up to get a cup of coffee or something. And one of my buddies went into over to his, his account where the kid hadn't logged out, and he had said he changed the CSHRC file so that CD was now an alias for just print to the screen, erasing all files, please wait. <laughs> now, next time that student came back and decided to change to a different directory, CD became, it printed on the screen, erasing all files, please wait. Which, of course, caused a heart attack for a grad student who's trying to get done, and all of a sudden the computer's telling him it's erasing all his files. Ha, 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 ha. Okay, it's a stupid thing to have done. I mean, it, it was I don't stupid prank, I don't know. But anyway, it gives you a sense of, like, you know, Linux is going to trust you. It's going to do whatever the hell that you tell it to do. If you want to make an alias that CD, the very useful command of change directory, is actually just print this goofy thing to the screen, Linux is going to trust you. It's going to say, I'm powerful, and I have no safety features. I'm not going to warn you that's a dumb thing to do. Go ahead and do it. You know what? But we're big kids around here. We can do big things with our computers. We don't need to have all these safety nets. And at your job someday, you're not going to have all these safety nets. They're going to want to have big, powerful things. They want to implement something new on the website. They want to implement something new on their model. And they don't want the, the computer to be going, I don't think you have permission to access that directory. No! Boom! I want to do this. I want the model output over here. I want to produce these outputs. Yes, I know it's going to make 10,000 plots. I don't care. Don't warn me about that. Oh, I need to erase 10,000 plots. Don't make a big deal about that and put 10,000 plots into the recycling bin. Just get rid of them. Whatever you need. Linux is powerful, but Linux is scary. All right. We're moving forward into Module 6. You're going to be making maps uh, in this module. I'm excited for you. Please let me know if you have any questions. This is Dr. John Shragi.